Okay. All right. Good afternoon. I can confirm that today is Friday. You're welcome. You're welcome. Breaking news. Yeah, breaking news. Listen, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I'm not very organized today. There we go. Uh, I know. <laughs> All right, uh, in a short while, we will be joined uh, by our guest, Ugochi Daniels, who is the Deputy Director General of the International Organization for Migration. She's here to brief you on the occasion of International Migrants Day, which is observed on the 18th of December. Um, this morning, the Secretary General delivered remarks at the General Assembly meeting marking the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as well as this year's Human Rights Prize. He reminded us that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a clarion call to act in accordance with the fundamental truths that each of us in an equal as an equal member of the single human family. 75 years ago, he said, the world must uh, recall that wisdom and act on it. Um, the Secretary General told delegates uh, that last year, almost 450 human rights defenders, journalists, and trade unionists were killed, 40% more than in the previous uh, year. Um, the human rights defenders, he said, uh, are are lights in the darkness, but as you know, their job is extremely uh, dangerous. Um, the human rights, the recipients for this year are were Julian Lussange from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Julio Pereira from Uruguay, and the Amman Center for Human Rights uh, Studies. Uh, for his part, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk, said the prize is an opportunity to celebrate human rights defenders and the enormous value they bring to societies all over the world. Speaking at, about today's recipients, he noted their extraordinary work changes, excuse me, their, he noted their extraordinary work changes the world for the better day by day. He called on member states to ensure human rights defenders are protected and able to do their work in safely. More information, lots more information is available on the internet. Um, also this morning, speaking via video conference uh, to Geneva at the Global Refugee Forum, the Secretary General noted that the forum comes at the close of a year of intense political division, conflict and climate catastrophes, and a year in which a record number of people are being pushed from their homes, fleeing violence, insecurity, and danger. The Secretary General pointed out that resources to support refugees are under enormous strain, especially in the Global South, which continues to host and welcome the overwhelming majority of refugees, stressing that protection and help for refugees should not be a lottery or disproportionate uh, or disproportionate burden that falls on a few countries and communities based solely on their geographic location. It is an obligation shared by all of humanity. His remarks were shared with you. Also today, UNHCR said that the forum closed with over $2.2 billion in pledges to improve the lives of refugees and hosts, and states that pledges to reset one million refugee by 2030, while governments and foundations launched a uh, pledged backed by new global sponsorship to help fund a further 3 million refugees across third countries through community sponsorship. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, a couple of updates uh, from Gaza, and a number of you had been asking me about uh, Karim Shalom, uh, the, the other crossing, and I can tell you that we welcome the announcement today that the border crossing at Karim Shalom will be open uh, for direct delivery of humanitarian assistance to Gaza. The fast implementation of this agreement will increase the flow of aid. A humanitarian ceasefire will increase the distribution of that aid across Gaza even uh, more. Um, our colleagues at OCHA say that many parts of Gaza remain flooded after the heavy rains that you've all seen uh, that have been taking place the last few days. That is, of course, compounding already extreme human 
uh, suffering. There have been clashes also, according to Ocha, in the vicinity of Al Auda Hospital in Jabalia, northern Gaza, with 250 doctors, patients, and their family members reportedly trapped. Communications are back after being down for several uh, hours uh, yesterday evening. The shutdown communication, of course, severely impacts the ability of emergency uh, workers and humanitarian workers to do their job and, of course, has a negative impact on the population as a whole. Um, UNRWA is telling us now that nearly 1.3 million displaced people are sheltering about 155 UNRWA installations. The average number of internally displaced people in UNRWA facilities, shelters, located in the middle and southern Gaza is 12,387, more than four times the capacity. Uh, eight out of 22 UNRWA health centers are still operational in the middle and southern parts of Gaza. Uh, and UNRWA continues to provide health care to internally displaced people at shelters through uh, 97 medical teams. Each team is composed of about one to two doctors and a nurse. 591 health workers in health centers and shelters uh, provide support to some 12,000 patients. And um, um, just moving on to uh, Sudan, our humanitarian colleagues are providing some updates from Sudan that do not look good. They are telling us that all humanitarian field missions uh, within um, Al Jazeera state have now been suspended until further notice. And they are warning that the clashes that erupted outside Wad Medani today in Al Jazeera state, uh, which is known as Sudan's breadbasket, threatens tens of thousands of civil civilians already displaced by the conflict. It's also a critical hub for a humanitarian operation. Uh, Wad Medani, to give you some uh, context, is about 136 kilometers southeast of Khartoum, the capital. Uh, Mr. Griffiths, our Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, is calling for an end to the fighting after eight months of war in Sudan. Just to provide a little bit more uh, information, Al Jazeera State already hosts more than half a million men, women, and children who fled the fighting since April uh, 15th. Shops and markets in Wad Madani um, have reportedly closed due to the fighting between the Sudanese army and the rapid support forces. A key bridge has also been partially closed. Turning to another conflict area, this time in Europe, in Ukraine, we, along with our humanitarian partners, are scaling up support for civilians in need as winter approaches. Today, an interagency convoy delivered three tons of humanitarian assistance for nearly 3,000 people who remain in Berislavska, one of the frontline communities in the Kherson region in southern Ukraine. Our humanitarian colleagues note that this small community has been severely impacted by the war with more than 80% of its residents having fled. Those who stayed are among the most vulnerable and subjected to constant bombardments that damages homes and decimates vital services, including access to electricity, gas, and basic supplies. Today's convoy brought solar lamps, hygiene kits, and repair materials that residents can fix and uh, fix damaged homes with. Uh, the winter assistance is, of course, uh, essential, with ongoing attacks putting millions of people at risk as temperatures drop. Today, not far from where we delivered those supplies, an attack in Kherson City killed one person and damaged homes in the local market. Humanitarian organizations responded with critical assistance. Across the Kherson region over the past months, more than 50,000 people have received winter assistance, including cash support for energy needs and the provision of winter and clothing and heating. In total, as mentioned yesterday, we and our partners have already provided 800,000 people in Ukraine with support uh, for the upcoming um, winter uh, months. Uh, also, I have a pretty detailed humanitarian update for you from Myanmar, another crisis point, where fighting between Myanmar armed forces and various groups persist across much of the country. The Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs tells us that more than 660,000 people are estimated to have been newly displaced since the escalation of armed conflict on the 27th of October. The situation remains fluid, with some people having been displaced multiple times and others starting to return home. Currently, a total of 2.6 million people are displaced across Myanmar. 
Our colleagues say that the current situation has resulted in civilian casualties, arbitrary arrest, exploitation, extortion, forced recruitment, and forced labor. Food, safe shelter, and hygiene kits, basic health services, and protection support remain a priority for humanitarian workers. There are reports of shortages of essential supplies in many areas due to the commercial and humanitarian transports being blocked. Despite the insecurity, access, and telecommunications challenges, humanitarian assistance continues to be provided where possible. For example, our partners have now reached more than 80% of those who are displaced in Shan State, in northern Shan State. We and our partners continue to seek access to more people impacted by the conflict. An interagency uh, mission was completed by the in, to the state of war earlier this morning with another set to deliver aid to displaced people in southern Shan. Despite urgings, the 2023 Humanitarian Response Plan, which calls for $890 million, or almost that, is just 29% funded at $257 million. With just over two weeks left in the year, we urgently need an injection of cash. Um, some of you have been asking me also about the Guyana-Venezuela talks. I can tell you that the Secretary General welcomes the commitments of Guyana and Venezuela, of the presidents of Guyana and Venezuela to settle their differences through peaceful means in accordance with international law, including the Geneva Agreement of 1966. He trusts that the commitments reached yesterday in Argyle and St. Vincent's and the Grenadines will result in an immediate de-escalation of tensions and a return to good neighborly relations. Um, the Secretary General commends the role played by the Prime Minister of St. Vincent's and the Grenadines, and who is also the pro tempore president of the Community of Latin American Caribbean States, otherwise known as CELAC, uh, the Prime Minister of uh, Dominica, uh, who is also the chairman of the Caribbean Community, otherwise known as CARICOM, and Brazil, um, for all the support they've provided uh, and also for all the support provided by regional countries to facilitate the discussions by President Ali and President Maduro. The Secretary General welcomes uh, the party's plan to meet again in Brazil in the coming months. He recalls that the border controversy between Guyana and Venezuela is before the International Court of Justice and does not take a position in relation to ongoing judicial proceedings. This morning, the Security Council held an open debate on addressing uh, the threats posed by diversion of illicit trafficking and misuse of small arms and light weapons and their ammunitions to peace and security. Our good friend Izumi Nakamitsu, the High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, noted that in his, in his most recent report, the Secretary General laments the deteriorating situation, security environment the escalation of armed conflict and the related surge in civilian casualties. In addition, she said, we, we, have, we um, have seen a continued rise in global military expenditures and the cost of small arms and light weapons for peace, security, and sustainable development. Ms. Nakamitsu stressed the need to fully integrate small arms and light weapons considerations throughout the Security Council's work. Uh, her remarks were shared with you. And lastly, we have a hundred and... 41 countries, and we want to thank Pyongyang for having paid its dues in full, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Edie. Uh, thank you, Steph. Um, does the Secretary General have any comment on the decision by one of the world's major shipping companies, the Danish company Maersk? to um, suspend all shipping through the Red Sea, which is one of the world's major shipping routes, well, because, I, of, because of the missile attacks mm -hmm. by the Houthis. Well, I mean, not so much a, a comment on, on their decision, which is a commercial decision and, frankly, uh, pretty understandable given the situation, uh, but it just illustrates in extremely vivid term uh, the impact of the continued attacks uh, by the Houthis uh, in this area, in, in the Red Sea and on major international shipping lanes. Freedom of navigation is a, is a bedrock of international law. It needs to be respected. Um, and it also, uh, obviously, that 
part of the world, that waterway is critical uh, to the global economy and to global commerce. Mr. Klein. Yes, actually, Edie took my first question. Thank uh, you. I, uh, I, I know you came prepared with a second one. I always have a back. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, my second question, or first right now, is uh, is there any update on UNRWA's uh, investigation of the uh, allegation by a Israeli hostage uh, that he was held captive by an UNRWA employed teacher? I know UNRWA put out a general denial, uh, but I'm inquiring as to whether there was any real serious investigation I here. I mean, there, there is a serious um, will on behalf of UNRWA to try to get more information, and they've asked uh, for more information. They're doing what they can, but I don't have an update for you on that front. Have they spoken, as far as you know, to the... Um, teacher who was allegedly involved? I think part of the, the, the challenge is that the, um, the, the, the allegation, which Anwar took seriously, did not name any names or, or, or anything. They, tried, they did try also to reach out to the journalists and to government authorities. Deji. I'm Karim Shalom. Uh, can you give us more detailed information? For example, um, Israel decided to open that that crossing, but do you know when would? No, exactly? obviously those details are still being worked out in discussions with uh, Kogat, the, the Israeli entity that uh, that we deal with on issues of having of access to uh, to Gaza. Uh, but we do hope that uh, this will be used as a transit point as quickly as, as possible. I'm going to ask you the question that you didn't follow my logic the other day. Does the UN have the capacity or ability, if they open this, to facilitate more trucks get into Gaza and deliver the humanitarian aids? I don't think that was the logic that I checked. But yeah, the short answer is yes. If, there, if there's more opening and more access, we will have more goods there will be more goods from the United Nations and international NGOs going in. Uh, there's there's offensive um, operation or gunfire close to Arafa. Uh, can the, can the UN confirm that? Because there's report there are reports uh, I mean, that there, there are. We, we are very much aware that there continues to be uh, operations in in many parts of the Gaza Strip. But I, I don't have the uh, the battle reports, field reports to. But, we'll, but, but yeah. it's close to the border crossing. Would that be I, I pretty mean, much you know, effect, uh, effective? Gaza is a small to the, place, yeah. right? So uh, there, are, there is fighting and, and conflict in many parts of the, of the Gaza Strip. OK, uh, one last, sorry, one last question. On hostages, uh, the Secretary General has met with some of the hostage, hostage families again recently. Yes, he met yesterday. Uh, he had a, I think, very long two-hour meeting. Uh, so what, what are the messages? Right, so he, he met with them two, two hours, uh, I think, with the families, and almost two hours, uh, with the families and friends of Israelis who were hostages. And I also understand some were families and friends of people who were, were killed on October 7th. He listened to them very intently. He listened to them uh, carefully to their stories, uh, to their pain. Um, he also expressed his full solidarity uh, with those families and the trauma they're going through. Uh, for the Secretary General's standpoint, it was useful to, to hear from them first, firsthand, not only, and also an opportunity for them to hear from him uh, directly, but it was also a chance for him to um, correct, I think, some of the distortion of his position uh, that we've seen in, in some quarters of, of Israel. Namely, uh, he made it clear to the families um, that he had repeatedly and publicly expressed his utter condemnation of the terrorist attacks conducted by Hamas on October 7th and what they, what, what they, had, uh, uh, what they had done. Also, that he had constantly asked for their immediate and unconditional release, that he had many times publicly and privately called for the Red Cross to be allowed to see uh, and visit uh, the hostages. And he also spent time outlining to the families his own personal efforts 
uh, in conversations with uh, Egyptian officials, with Qatari officials and others, uh, his efforts uh, to uh, secure uh, the release of the hostages. So the, those, those family members are, uh, were in New York meet, meeting with Yes, they, they uh, met downstairs. Uh, there was a large, pretty so large So what, 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 what was the response from, from the family members? I, I, Is, I, uh, was I, that positive? I can't speak for them. It's, not, it's definitely uh, it, not for me to speak for them. But I think, you know, the, the Secretary General had met with families um, earlier, uh, I think about a month ago. Uh, he, um, he had particularly followed a number of cases with those families that he had met with uh, previously. Um, and he also, I, some of you know, there's on f Fridays, there are usually a group of people demonstrating in front of his residence. Um, he spoke to them again. He spoke to those people this morning uh, and kind of explained that he had met with other uh, families of hostages uh, yesterday. Gabriel. Hello. Thanks, Steph. Um, at this very moment, that we're here, we believe that uh, a journalist, Samu Abu Dhaka, uh, an Al Jazeera cameraman, is bleeding uh, after being injured covering an Israeli airstrike on a UN-run school in Khan Yunus. We believe it's over six hours now that he has been unable to get any sort of attention, according to the Palestinian Red Crescent, uh, rescue crews that are trying to reach him near or at the school uh, are not able to get there due to uh, fighting and or Israeli uh, 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 shooting. Has the Secretary General been briefed about this at all? And what is his message in terms of allowing access to get to people that are injured in or around UN facilities right now? Yes, he has been briefed about it. I mentioned it to him this morning. I've been in touch with your colleagues in Doha. Uh, our colleagues on the ground, the World Health Organization, are also doing what they can. Uh, it is uh, critical that journalists be able to do their work free from violent attacks, uh, free from violence. Uh, and we do hope that all the parties involved will help facilitate uh, his, um, his evacuation uh, to, to a hospital as quickly as possible. But I can tell you something I've, I was dealing with just a few minutes ago uh, as well. If I could, the Secretary General and yourself have said over and over in the last two months, journalists must be protected, UN facilities must be protected. They're still not being protected, either one of them. When is enough enough? Now is enough, right? Uh, I mean, as in any conflict, we, you know, the Secretary General is not the one with his hands on the trigger. Uh, and, and we said this over and over again, um, the, the guns must be silenced. We've called for a humanitarian ceasefire, and we, this is, we, we have called for the guns to be silenced in, in conflicts all over the world where journalists are, are being killed, where UN uh, facilities uh, are, be, are being destroyed, and where innocent civilians are paying the price. Last follow-up. Not just our journalist, but how concerned is the Secretary General about trying to reach other people at that UN school as well. Of course, well. I mean, we're, we're just, I, I, you know, the, the, the latest numbers on, on the death toll uh, from the, the health ministry in Gaza is, is, is staggering. Uh, and and we, we don't, we also don't know what we don't know. Those numbers may be much higher. Yes, sir. Thank you, Stefan. Ali Rajabi, uh, correspondent of Iran TV, IRIB. What's the Secretary General's position regarding a terrorist attack on a police station in Rosk in Iran? Yes, we've seen those reports. I'm waiting for some language. I hope to have a statement on this very shortly. Uh, let me go to Dulce, then I'll go to the screen. And Joe, I promise to come back to you. Uh, just about uh, Myanmar, is the Secretary General going to name a new envoy for Myanmar? Uh, yes, that process is moving forward. As soon as we have something to announce, we will. Uh, let's go to uh, the videotape, as Wolf Blitzer would have said. Zara, please. Hi, Estef. Hi, Zara. Um, uh, 
It's mean, uh, is the Secretary General not going to condemn this ter terrorist attack in Iran today? No, as, as, I, as I said, uh, I'm waiting for some language on that, uh, and we will have, I expect to have a statement or note to correspondence for you very shortly. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We are waiting. Okay. Um, I will not delay. Uh, Jordan, then Nabil. Good afternoon. Uh, my question uh, is the same on journalists. Uh, as of today, there are 89 journalists were killed in two months by Israel in Gaza. Uh, beside the cameraman uh, today, also journalist of Al Jazeera, Wal Dahdouh, the one who lost his family last uh, two weeks ago or a few weeks ago, also was shot in, in the hand. Is there is any like strong message from you? like condemnation of killing journalists. Uh, it's, it's a huge number, 89 in two months, uh, which is by many organizations, it's more than the whole year of jo the whole war. Uh, Jordan, I think, uh, I think we have been talking about this, sadly, quite a lot, and we have been condemning every incident very strongly. Uh, okay, my, yeah, I have to, I did not finish. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. My question, do you know, uh, because we received two uh, press releases on the visit of deputy, uh, I mean, uh, USG for political uh, affairs uh, to Palestine and Israel. Do you know why she was unable to meet the families of um, settlers violence families or the, 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 the people in jail, why she did not meet the families as she did I, with, with other party? I, I don't have any more details on her visit. If I, if I get something, I will share it with you. Um, okay, and the last, the last, uh, the last one, if, you, if I may. Um, why the SG uh, does not call for immediate release and credential release of the 3,000 people uh, they were taking from West Bank, not from Gaza, from West Bank and Jerusalem since October 7th. I mean, 3,000 in jail. I, Why didn't you call I, for I would, I would refer, the Secretary General has repeatedly in, in his reports, and I think there's one coming out soon, uh, calling for the release of people who are held in administrative detention. Uh, Nabil, Joe, and then we have to go to our guest who's been very patient. Go ahead, Nabil. Nabil? Sorry, yes, I just unmuted myself. So uh, my question is, I uh, uh, would like to know if the SG is interested in also meeting or be in touch with uh, the Palestinian families of uh, the Palestinian detainees uh, uh, in the Israeli uh, jails, and, and especially that uh, the Israeli army has uh, arrested tens, at least tens, of, of uh, Palestinian men in Gaza and the West Bank in the last few weeks. Uh, the, the Secretary General met with the families at their request. Uh, he is always open, and I've always known him to be open, to meeting with families of, of people who are suffering who have been jailed, uh, who have been uh, victims. Uh, his door has always been open and will remain so. Um, As a follow-up, yeah. um, like uh, who in the UN uh, or any UN official uh, have any has any UN official met with the Palestinian families, or is there any plan to meet them and to know? or to collect information about the Palestinian detainees? I, I believe some of our colleagues at the UN, uh, our UN country team for the, uh, our UN team for the Occupied Palestinian Territory have had those meetings, but I will check for you. Thank you. Mr. Klein, and then we'll go to our guest. Yes, uh, a couple of questions. First of all, uh, there are thousands of Palestinians who have gathered near the Gaza-Egypt border and want desperately to be able to escape the violence in Gaza and uh, get into Egypt. But Egypt uh, continues to block any such access to these uh, ref refugees uh, if they were to be able to cross. So I'd like to know whether there's any comment 
uh, by the Secretary General on Egypt's continued intransigence and in not allowing well, I, I, uh, you know the, the Gazans to pass through as refugees into Egypt. That's my I, first question. Our aim is for humanitarian ceasefire so people can uh, remain where they live. Uh, we are concerned about regional destabilization or the forced movement of people. And I can't speak to uh, the state of mind of civilians uh, in Gaza. I don't know what their intentions or, or wishes are. You, your second question, sir. Yeah. Uh, you made reference uh, previously in one of your responses to uh, uh, characterizing the attack on October 7th as a, a terrorist attack by Hamas. Uh, this goes further than what the General Assembly or the Security Council have been willing to do. They have not condemned the attack. They have, they have refused to brand it as uh, Hamas as a terrorist organization. So is the Secretary General uh, going beyond uh, I mean, this in characterizing I mean, that's, Hamas that's a, that's a, uh, a as a That's a compare and contrast that falls in your bailiwick, Joe. Uh, uh, he, he has used these same words since the beginning. The Secretary General is the Secretary General. The member states are the member states. Okay. Final very quick question. You know, are there any plans in the near future for the Secretary General to personally visit um, Israel West Bank and, and meet with Israeli it, and Palestinian officials. As soon as it is practicable, it will, it would, and useful, it will happen. I would ask you, please, to remain in your seats because we haven't landed and we have a guest. <laughs>